Math, the Gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them when, what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, that I too may come and worship him. And after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh, and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Well, that first King Herod, uh, the one in our scripture reading for today, was called Herod the Great. He wasn't called Herod the mediocre or Herod the, Herod the middling, right? He, was, he earned that moniker by being a very successful king according to the standards of the world. And he ruled the Judah under the Roman Empire from 34 BC to 4 AD. Now the Romans often allowed vassal rulers like Herod to rule to, in order to keep the peace and make sure the taxes got to Rome. As long as didn't have to worry about maintaining order, and they got their taxes at the time, well, Herod was free to rule as he deemed fit. And Herod took full advantage. He was a very shrewd and cunning leader, and he rid the region of bandits. Uh, he carried out some impressive building projects and uh, several threats to his regime. However, he was not Herod the Nice, either. He prohibited protests and instituted a secret police, and he had a penchant for killing those who opposed him, even up to three of his own sons. If there was one thing that King Herod understood, it was fear. He knew the power that fear held over people when their livelihood or their lives were threatened. He knew the Romans, fear that the empire would revolt or that instability would threaten the empire. Herod wanted obedience, and he wanted results, and his ruthless actions and reputation capitalized on fear to achieve results. But while Herod ruled through fear, fear also ruled Herod and the whole kingdom. We can see this from when the Magi from the east arrive in Jerusalem, and they ask, Where is the one who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. We're saying that, opening hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and it's a great hymn because it reminds us that this is Israel's Savior. This is Israel's salvation that has come. Uh, but most of God's people don't recognize this fact. In fact, when Herod heard this, he was scared. This is intended to be good news, uh, deliverance from God's enemies, uh, but the thought of a rival sneaking up on him frightened Herod. Even, interestingly, Matthew tells us something else, that all Jerusalem was scared as well. Now, I'm not sure we can really 100% pinpoint what uh, the reason for that fear was. Perhaps the capital city was more concerned about its political stability than Yahweh's plan. Maybe they were simply scared because they knew how Herod might react to this news. It's probable that all of Jerusalem, that phrase, doesn't necessarily mean every last individual in Jerusalem, but clearly a significant portion of the city heard the news and was scared. Was it simply those in power who didn't want their tight grip on the nation compromised? Was it people who preferred sin to salvation? 
It's hard to know for sure, but what's crystal clear is this. Even the, the capital city of God's own people, Jerusalem, was not ready for this king sent from heaven. Age sought to exert control over the situation. He chose manipulation at first. That's wonderful. My scholars tell me the new king will be born in Bethlehem, so go and find this king. And when you're done, make sure to tell me where he is so I can go and worship him as well. Of course, we know that Herod was not sincere. He was lying between his sort of royal teeth. He did not want to worship the child, but he wanted to eliminate a threat to his power. Herod was, had risen to power kind of out of nothing. Uh, uh, he had not had, um, well, and his father was connected, but he, he would, there was no royal history uh, there, but, and he was not a Jew. In fact, he was an Edomite, and there was really no way in which, any scriptural way in which Herod was a legitimate king, and everyone knew it, but it didn't matter because he had Roman backing, and he relied on fear and power. And he knew uh, that he was feared and despised, and, and currently that fear was overpowering the disdain of the people for him. But if they thought that they had a leader with God's own backing, he was afraid what that might do. It might tip the balance from fear being overwhelmed by disdain or anger. So Herod planned to do what uncontrolled fear often drives us to do, to destroy that which challenges us. Still, today, it's easy to lead or steer through fear. Even seemingly good leaders can do bad things. Why, even in our Old Testament lesson, David abused his powers at times. Now, you may remember the story, uh, and when he's facing the consequences of his sin, uh, when he's going to be found out because uh, Bathsheba is pregnant, he arranges for her husband, a, a faithful warrior who fights for David and for the kingdom, to be abandoned on the battlefield and killed so he can marry her and sort of get away with this. In our Old Testament reading, David, who is usually a faithful king, has hardened his heart. Maybe in the back of his mind, he knows that this is not okay, but he's refusing to face the truth. So the prophet Nathan tells this story about a lamb killed and by a rich and abusive neighbor. And David's shepherd heart responds, the man who has done this deserves to die. Nathan says, you are the man. You done what was politically and personally expedient. And in so doing, you have a good man's blood on your hands. You will be punished. Your kingdom will not be secure. And your son, David, your son, David, who was to be the king, shall pay the price for your sins. Well, that's the ultimate result of sin, pain, sorrow, and death. It's unpleasant, but it still happens today. It happens over and over and over. So many times people choose to make selfish decisions and others around them get hurt. We could think of a, a million different circumstances. Um, Sometimes, like David, our own sins and our callous disregard for others because we don't want to be bothered or we don't want to be punished, can, we can cause pain and sorrow for others. We want what we want, we want, and we close our eyes to the pain it causes around us. We disregard our responsibility to others, and we lust and strive for things that are not rightfully ours. The details are different. But the path of sin always leads to the same end, pain, sorrow, and ultimately death, not only physical, but spiritual death. In fact, that's what we would all be destined for if not for this king born in Bethlehem. The power and authority, the kingdom of Jesus sometimes scares the world around us. Families may say, oh, you're taking this Jesus thing too far, especially if your faith were to interfere with anything I want to do. If you won't do what I want, then you don't love me. Work might say, well, you got to do whatever it takes in this world. You can't be so picky or worried about right and wrong and ethics. Just do what you need to. Make us some money and make life easier on all of us. Government itself sometimes is even bothered by religion. Do what we tell you to. 
Don't make our job any more complicated. We are the ultimate authority. Listen to us above all. But remember, we have a new king in Christ our Lord. He may not look like a king, wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger, but he is a king nonetheless. The results of sinful, selfish action in the world, same today as they were back then, pain, sorrow, and death. But this king comes to teach us a new way. We no longer have to add to in this world. We no longer have to think only about our own interests to the detriment of others. Instead, we can, like David, respond and say, Surely, Lord, as he said in 51, after in re- the psalm written in response to this story, Surely you desire truth in the inner parts, but I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Nathan had said, you are guilty, David. You are the man. And David, your son, who was to be the king, shall pay the price for your evil deed. The future king, the son of David, it's unfair, but he would pay the price. Of course, this was maybe a dark foreshadowing of the true son of David, Jesus the anointed, who was to be the king, who would ultimately pay the price of sin. He should have been acclaimed as king at his arrival, and by all rights the world should have worshipped him and paid him homage. But the good news is that this king was not, that this king was rejected, mocked, and crucified. And nonetheless, God chose to have mercy and regard Jesus' innocent death as a sacrifice, when he very easily and very naturally could have chosen to seek vengeance for this betrayal, for this killing of God's own son, of our king. But Jesus will die because of sin, not his own, but ours. But the good news is also that he rose to life and gives us that same. This world and our own lives sometimes can be filled with ugliness. But the good news is we know where to turn, even if not everybody around us does. We can turn to the son of David. We can see not only a baby lying in a manger, but a Savior, the Lamb of God, who will shed his innocent blood for the forgiveness of my sins. We don't have to rely or look upon the world or the rulers of this world. Rather, we throw ourselves in the mercy of God which he gives to us in Jesus. And so this Advent and Christmas season, a little reminder, we know this world can sometimes be an ugly place, but the Son of God was sent to save the human race. In Jesus' name, amen.